Right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, once more. Let me welcome you formally to Sidron Nigeria Limited EDI uh, training batch eight. Uh, sorry, we are starting a little bit late. Uh, we're using the opportunity to see uh, if we can have more of your members joining the class. Uh, we're supposed to have a class of about 36 people, but so far only about 14 have joined. Uh, so we're using this opportunity to see if more and more people can link in. Some are having problems uh, with uh, joining the Zoom class. It's always a challenge we have with uh, such classes. But I guess we we'll just have to continue while waiting for them. Uh, you are an entirely new group of people, and this is our very first uh, lecture with you. Uh, if there are any issues uh, somewhere down the line, we'll pause so that uh, we can be able to share some of your concerns and if you have any questions that you want to ask. Well, uh, as you can see on your screen, uh, it's a very telling uh, advice uh, a father, an elderly, eld an elder is giving to his young daughter. Uh, if your salary is your only source of income, you are one step ahead, one step away from poverty. And that's some of the realities of our time. So what he's suggesting in essence is that uh, you should have another source of uh, income. If you are a paid uh, employee, uh, you are on a salary, you work for somebody, it says that you should also try to find something else to do and have multiple sources of income. And I think that's a very, very good advice. Uh, any father, any elder will give to a young chap who is coming up. Uh, we started by posting on our platform uh, the pre-lecture quiz. I don't know how many of you have attempted it, but that's our tradition here in Cedron. Uh, for all of our lectures, as indicated in some of the joining notes I passed earlier on the platform, before we start our lectures, we give the pre-lecture quiz uh, to try and uh, test your knowledge of the subjects that uh, we're trying to teach. And, and uh, at the end of uh, that same lecture, we'll also repeat the test again, we call it post-lecture quiz, to see if you understand uh, uh, if the lecture was able to make any difference to your understanding of the subject. So we're able to compare your scores pre and then uh, after the lecture. Uh, how many of you were able to attempt it or do the quiz so that we know whether we can continue from there or give you some little time to do that. Can you indicate, uh, can you go back to your WhatsApp platform and uh, indicate if you were able to do that by, by saying yes, typing yes on the platform, on the pre, uh, on the training platform. Can we do that quickly so that we know how to proceed from there? I hope you guys are hearing me. If you have attempted the quiz, please go back to our training platform on the WhatsApp page and type yes. Let's see how many of you have been able to uh, attempt it. Some are indicating here that uh, they've not been able to open the question. Or you can check the chat on the, on, on the, uh, on our, on our platform here on the Zoom platform and then indicate whether you are able to attend the, attend the quiz or not.
response from Nicholas. Are you guys hearing me? Have you attempted the quiz? Nobody seems to be responding. Have you attempted a quiz on the training platform? Please go to your WhatsApp platform and indicate whether you've done the quiz or not so that we can know how to proceed from there. You can unmute and speak to us too. Please unmute them. Let's, let's, let's have some music. You can unmute your mics, please, and then uh, let's, so that we can ask, we can discuss. Have you been able to do the, the quiz on the platform? Can we have some responses, please? Yes, uh, Jamil, Yaya, have you been able to do your quiz? I don't get it. Sorry? Have you done the quiz? I don't get connected. We posted the quiz on the- I got connected. Oh, you just got connected? Okay. okay. We yes, posted it. Yeah, we posted the quiz on the training platform. And we want, uh, we call it a pre-lecture quiz. We want members to, right. the class to do it first before we proceed with the lecture. Right, let me take it off. Please check your training okay, platform and you. we'll do that. All right. Is that on WhatsApp? All right. Yes, yeah, it's on WhatsApp, it's on the WhatsApp platform. Oh. Mr. Ramat, have you been able to do it? Mr. Ramat, I mean, Mr. Ramat. Unmute your mark and talk to us. Tochiku Wibo, how far have you been able to do it? I'm on it right now. OK. Yeah. All right. Please, let's take another five minutes to go through it, please. Mala Ahmed in Saramat. Have you tried it? Have you tried the quiz? Mr. Ramat, please. Are we to fill in everything on the quiz? Yeah, just, yes, you have to attempt everything. That's just 10 questions. No, what I'm asking, the place for what, uh, email, full name, are we to? Yeah, just complete it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we're, we're supposed to see the, the results at the end of the day, and that's how we we'll get, we'll get communication with you. Okay. All right. And when you do, you will see, you'll be able to check your scores to see what you scored. Okay. Yes, Mr. Ramat, uh, how far? Have you done the quiz? Ahmed Isa Ramat, talk to us. You are highlighted. Have you done the quiz? Not okay. Hope you are my praise. Are you with us? Let's like, uh, continue. Okay, I guess we can uh, start the lecture and continue while waiting for the guys to join.
so please let's uh, mute our mics. All right, thank you. So the very first uh, topic we are taking for this uh, training is entrepreneurship and skills acquisition for EGNIS. Uh, the whole essence of the training that we have, ours is, uh, is an entrepreneurship uh, training, not a vocational training. Uh, so it's, what it means is that we're supposed to give you some preliminary backgrounds about what uh, entrepreneurship is all about and then the skills you require, the skills you require for, uh, for entrepreneurial uh, activities. So it is therefore fitting that uh, the very first uh, lecture that we'll have should be on entrepreneurship and skills acquisition uh, for EGMIS. I'm sure you're all aware of what EGMIS is all about. Uh, down the line, we'll be uh, explaining more and more about that. But, so that's the whole essence of uh, this very, very program, entrepreneurship. At the end of the day, they will ask you, uh, what kind of training did you undergo? Was it vocational or entrepreneurship? And you'll be able to tell them that it's uh, entrepreneurship. Tell her that the pastors are going. Right, so let's start by asking the training objectives. What are the training objectives of uh, this very session? First is to understand uh, EGMIS loan, the EGMIS loan scheme. What does it entail? What is EGMIS? And uh, why the program? The second is to expose participants to the objectives, components, and processes of uh, achieving the goals of EGNIS. Okay, we we'll find out what the objectives are, what the components are, and then the process of uh, achieving the goals of EGNIS. Then to understand the concept, the concept of entrepreneurship. What is entrepreneurship? What we understand by the concept of entrepreneurship? What does it entail? Who is an entrepreneur? What does an entrepreneur do? Those are the kind of questions we'll be asking and then uh, finding an answers to. Then to expose participants to the skills required for entrepreneurship. What are the needed skills? What are the necessary skills that you require for entrepreneurship? And then to prepare participants for a life of entrepreneurship. If you want to be an entrepreneur, what are the expectations? Uh, is it a bed of roses? Are there challenges that you're likely to face? And all of those things. So we'll be able to uh, see what it entails and then uh, how you go about uh, a life of entrepreneurship and then the challenges that come with it and what you uh, expect to find along the line or at the end of the road. Do you start from uh, a small company to end up as a very big major concern, major company, or are you going to be truncated and left where you started? So those are the things we'll be looking at. So training outline. Uh, the very first things we'll be looking at are defining IGMIS, its objectives, uh, components, and then the processes of attaining the goals of uh, uh, attaining these goals. Uh, secondly, we'll be defining uh, entrepreneurship. What is entrepreneurship? And then types of businesses and vocational skills. Then uh, things you need to consider before starting a business. What do you need to consider before starting a business? You all want to start a business now. Uh, what have you considered? What have you thought about? What have you done uh, in starting that business? So these are things that we need to look at and then uh, should be able to discuss uh, be able to guide ourselves on the things that we need to look at. Okay, hurdles in the path of starting a business. Uh, like we say, everything in life uh, has its own barriers, its own challenges. There, there are no bed or roses. Whatever it is that you want to do, uh, you can be sure that uh, there will be one or two hurdles along the way. So what are, uh, what are those hurdles and how do you overcome them? And sources of funding for small and medium enterprises. What are the, what are the sources of uh, funds. Uh, we're all here uh, attend, uh, attending these lectures today, uh, applying uh, for the EGMIS loans uh, because we want to source for funds. Okay, So this very particular uh, training program is uh, an avenue for you to be able to assess uh, the, the, the funds for uh, to start your own business. So we'll be looking at uh, other sources or, other than are the one that you are embarking on now. So let's start by defining EGMIS. So what is EGMIS? Uh, EGMIS is an acronym. An acronym is uh, a word that you form from the first letters of uh, a sentence. So uh, EGMIS, as it is, stands for Agribusiness Small and Medium Enterprises Investment Scheme. Okay. 
So that is the, the definition. That is the full, sorry, the full meaning of EGNIS. AG, AG stands for agribusiness. SME stands for small and medium enterprises. IS stands for investment scheme, EGNIS. So what is EGNIS then? It is an initiative of the Central Bank of Nigeria aimed at supporting the federal government agenda for the promotion of agribusinesses and small slash medium enterprises as vehicles for a sustainable economic development and employment. So it is, it is an initiative of the central bank, not just the central bank, but the committee of bankers, the committee of bankers of Nigeria. And when we say committee of bankers, uh, it's made up, committee of bankers are made up of uh, the chief executives of all the money, de deposit money banks that we have in the country. That's the interest-based banks, the major banks that we have, banks like the First Bank, Union Bank, Zenit, Assets, uh, GT, and the rest of them. They, are, they form the board, what we call the body of uh, committee of bankers, along with the CBN, okay? Uh, that is their own way of supporting the federal government's agenda in promoting agricultural business and then uh, the challenges of unemployment. We'll be talking more about that down the line. So objectives of EGMIS, what are the objectives of EGMIS? First and foremost is to ensure small and medium enterprises have access to, uh, to finance, okay? To generate much needed employment opportunities. Sorry, these small and, and medium enterprises have, uh, uh, the, sorry, the first objective is to ensure that small and medium enterprises have access to finance. Okay? Small and medium enterprises have access to finance. Secondly, to generate much needed employment uh, opportunities in the country, uh, in Nigeria, and, uh, to boost the managerial capacity of agribusinesses, SMEs, as pipelines for, of growing enterprises that can become huge corporations. And then uh, efforts to develop agricultural mm -hmm. value chain and ensure a sustainable agricultural practice. Okay, so that's basically the objectives. First and foremost, uh, to ensure small and medium enterprises have access to, to uh, finance. One of, it's found that one of the major challenges that small and medium enterprises have in the country is having access to finance. So how do they have gain that access? The EGMIS uh, loan scheme is one of those uh, avenues where uh, SMEs can have access to, to finance. Secondly, generating needed employment opportunities. Today we are faced with the challenges of unemployment in the country. So many of our young men, so many of our young men, so many of our young men, uh, so many of our young men are roaming the streets without any uh, employment. Uh, young graduates, uh, the country is churning out uh, uh, so many graduates on a yearly basis from uh, universities or other, other tertiary institutions without any means of uh, employment. So how do, they, how do we accommodate these teaming youths that are uh, needing employment. And of course, because of the COVID situation we find ourselves in the country today, uh, so many organizations uh, have disengaged their staff because of the challenges of, uh, of the market. Uh, so many companies are going to sort of their needed uh, source of, uh, of, of income, source of raw materials for productivity. And so uh, this is shutting down. Please, can you mute your, your, your mics, please? Because we are having some distractions at the background in whichever office you are, okay? So one of the ways that uh, the government thought about helping uh, the unemployment situation is through provision of these loans for those who are interested to be able to assess it and then start their own businesses. Then to boost the managerial capacity of agribusinesses. Of course, through this training, uh, small business owners and uh, startups will not be able to have some of the needed skills required to manage a business. Uh, after this particular introductory uh, topic, there will be other topics down the line uh, that will help you in how to manage a business, okay? We'll have things like uh, feasibility studies and uh, business plan. We'll have uh, financial planning and uh, basic bookkeeping, marketing, and then uh, sales strategies. And then, of course, uh, uh, 
business registration, the compliance requirements for businesses in the country. Those are the kind of uh, topics that you'll be having down the line to help you uh, in managing your business. And then, of course, we know that agric is a major, uh, is a mainstay of Nigeria's economy. So, and the agri uh, agricultural sector has a lot of value chains. So many things you can do uh, down the line in agriculture. It's, agriculture is not just about farming. Okay, it also involves uh, it, it was marketing, it was processing, uh, exportation, and a whole lot of other things. That's what we call the agricultural value chain. Okay, so these are the things that uh, this that uh, EGMIS, the EGMIS uh, loan scheme, uh, wants to expose the participants to and then uh, prepare them for uh, those kind of services. So let's break down uh, the components of EGMIS. What does EGMIS entail? So we want to look at uh, the various components of, of EGMIS. We have defined EGMIS already as agribusiness and small and medium enterprises as a vehicle for economic development and employment. So let's start by looking at agribusiness. Okay, that's the first two uh, letters of the acronym, agribusiness. In, 20, in 2019, agriculture contributed of around 21.91% to Nigeria's uh, GDP, surpassed only by industry at 27.38% and services, uh, services sector at 49.73%. Okay? So what we're saying in essence is that that agriculture is a major uh, contributor to Nigeria's GDP. Uh, although Nigeria depends heavily on the oil sector for its budgetary revenue, Nigeria is predominantly an agricultural society with approximately 70% of the population engaged in agricultural production at subsistence level. So we're trying to make a comparison here between uh, agri agricultural contribution uh, to Nigeria's GDP and that of oil. We're all aware of uh, that Nigeria is today a mono economy, dependent as it were mostly on uh, oil, uh, oil and gas, the oil and gas sector, where over uh, ninety percent of Nigeria's resources, uh, revenue earning comes from uh, oil and gas. But in terms of uh, GDP contribution, uh, the oil and gas contribution to Nigeria, uh, to Nigeria's economy, uh, in terms of GDP contribution, is just about ten percent. Uh, in 2015, it was uh, uh, 8%. By 2016, it was uh, just about uh, uh, 9%. So you can see, compared to agriculture, which is 21.91%, you can find that the agriculture is the main state, major contributor to Nigeria's GDP than even oil. Though oil is uh, the main source of uh, the largest contributor to Nigeria's uh, revenue. Okay. So it is this trend, it is this trend, the trend of agricultural contribution, agricultural sector contribution uh, to the Nigerian economy that the federal government, that the government wants to leverage on in its attempt to diversify the economy from oil. Okay. So to Nigeria realize that in fact, we are all witness to the situation we have in the country today because of the COVID situation where the economy of the entire world is grounded. Most of the economy, most, most of the uh, nation's economy uh, all over the world is grounded uh, and there are very little economic activities going on all over the place. We have stories about uh, oil tankers uh, uh, stuck in along the ocean routes all over the world. You know, there are no flies, no flies and no uh, industrial activities going on. So no major requests, no major demand for oil. And of course, we're also aware of the, uh, the challenge between Russia and the Saudi Arabia with their contestation power show here and there, which uh, led so much to uh, oil growth in the market, and then uh, the sudden collapse in oil revenue. That one definitely affected the Nigerian economy substantially uh, to the extent that uh, Nigeria's oil revenue crashed substantially and was little coming from that way. To avoid that kind of situation where Nigeria is uh, stuck, uh, each time there is a challenge in the oil economy sector, uh, Nigeria is finding, the government is trying to find a way where it can diversify its own economy and see how uh, it can be able to uh, sustain itself in, in times of challenges like that. So agri sector is one of those areas that uh, the federal government has identified uh, as uh, a major source of, uh, of revenue and therefore, therefore the, the need for diversification. Uh, I'm sure you are also aware of the current government efforts and devoted efforts and energy uh, to initiatives like the Ankoboras uh, program, uh, which are now, of course, the EGMIS. 
the anchor borrowers program, uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, the federal government's CBN's uh, attempt uh, provision of uh, oh, no. uh, resources uh, geared towards encouraging uh, rice farming in the country. Uh, you are all aware of the, the major rice uh, plantations we have, farms we have in Kebi, uh, in uh, Eboyi, Benue, uh, Ogun, and a whole lot of other places. Uh, the whole idea is that Nigeria has been dependent so much on importation of rice for so many years, okay? And uh, the, the wage bills uh, on importation of rice is such that uh, it's crippling the economy of the country. And this is in a country where we have all the land and then all the land and then the men and material to also be able to plant and uh, grow our own rice to be able to be self-sustaining. So the federal government is trying to divert away from rice importation to the extent that, of course, it has uh, placed an embargo on importation of rice. Most of the rice that we have in the country today are imported rice because the federal government has decided that it should put a stop to it, block the importation of, of rice so that Nigerians will also be encouraged to grow their own rice. And one of the ways of encouraging that, uh, that initiative is through the Anko Boros, uh, program. And uh, in the last few years, we've seen the collaboration between states like Kebi and Lagos uh, with their lake rice. Uh, we've seen also the major rice uh, milling efforts in Anambra and Eboe and the rest of the states, Ebu State as well, where pyramids of rice were being uh, shown not too long ago. So that is part of government's initiative at, uh, at our own food security and providing the needed uh, food that we require in the country. Now, the EGMIS loan scheme is also geared along that line. That's promoting agri and agri-related uh, businesses. So the, this, this drive is the recognition of the contribution of agriculture to economic growth and development, providing food to the expanding population, increasing the demand for industrial products, uh, providing local foreign uh, exchange earnings for imports of capital goods, uh, increasing social, increasing social, in, uh, social income, providing employment and welfare of the citizen. That's basically a summary of uh, all of the things I've, I've, I've just said. Uh, agri uh, agriculture is a major uh, source of uh, economic growth for the country and the growth and development for the country. Source of providing uh, food for our expanding population. Any country that is not able to feed its own population, of course, you know, it's a country that is in, in, in a major problem, okay? Uh, our population keeps increasing. Uh, we cannot support that expanding population by, by continuous importation of, uh, of food. Any country that wants to be independent has to be able to feed its own people. If not, uh, we have problems uh, along the line. Uh, I've already also talked about the problems of uh, unemployment, and uh, it's, it's found that agri is one of uh, the major areas uh, that the teeming population in the country uh, can be engaged and through that, of course, uh, the earnings that will improve the welfare of our people. It is these gains that explain the need to support the, agri uh, the growth and expansion of agri and agri-allied uh, agro -allied industry and its associate, associated uh, value chain. So the, the summary of all of this is that uh, the contribution of agri towards the, uh, providing food for the expanding population uh, providing uh, raw materials for our industrial uh, needs and industrial products. Uh, the foreign exchange earnings that come from exportation of our food and all of that, that explains why the government sees the need and then the bankers, co committee of bankers, sees the need of uh, supporting the government uh, in diversifying the economy by providing the needed funds and resources uh, for expansion of agri and agro-related uh, uh, industries. So let's look at the second component of EGMIS. First, we have looked at the AG, which is agribusiness. So the second component is uh, the SME component. SMEs are small and medium enterprises. So the SME sector is a backbone of major developed economies, as well as important contributors to employment, economic, and export growth. Okay, according to the Nigeria SME survey by PwC 2019, in Nigeria, SMEs contribute 48% of uh, national GDP, accounting for 96% of businesses and 48% 48% of employment. So that, what it says essentially is that all over the world, the world over, among even the major uh, developed economies, 
as well as uh, as well as developing economies. SMEs, the SME, the small and medium enterprises, are the backbone, are the backbone of uh, of uh, these economies. Okay, SMEs normally start as small businesses, but today they grow up to be major, to be major, to be major enterprises the world over. Okay. Uh, we are very familiar with uh, major corporations today like the Apple, Apple for example, like uh, Apple Company, the com makers of uh, Apple Computer, makers of the iPhone that we use today, uh, makers of the iPod and iPads. They all started as SMEs. Today, almost everybody is on, was on, uh, on uh, Facebook. Facebook and the WhatsApp that we are using, they all started as SMEs. Okay? So this is, this is how SMEs start to become major, the major backbones of uh, most economies in the world. So, and that singular fact is recognized. Uh, the Nigerian SME survey uh, is giving us the picture of Nigeria. It says that 48% SMEs in Nigeria contribute 48% uh, of national GDP. Compare that one to oil, compare that one to, to agri. Okay? It is one of the major contributors, and it accounts for 96% of the businesses. So most of the businesses we find in Nigeria today, they are not major, uh, major uh, industrial out, uh, outlets, but small SMEs, small small businesses. They account most of the business that we have in the country today. 96% of them are SMEs. And for employment, we say there's a major crisis of unemployment in the country today, about 23%. Uh, we have about 23% figure of unemployment in the country today. But 48% of those who are employed, who are lucky to be employed, are involved in the SME sector. So that goes to show how important uh, the SME sector is in Nigeria today. Uh, it, the Nigerian SME constitute about 17.4 about million jobs. Okay, they account for 50% of industrial jobs and nearly 90% of the manufacturing sector in, in terms of enterprises. So these are very, very fundamental statistics that we have. 50% of the industrial jobs that we have today uh, SME base. And the, for manufacturing, 90% of the manufacturing sector is also uh, of SMEs. That's in terms of enterprises. So you can, there's no way that you can discount of SMEs. And of course, Nigeria is towing the path of other major economies around the world uh, by building and emphasizing on SMEs. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, in collaboration with the Small and Medium Enterprises Development Agencies, MEDAN, the SME sector in Nigeria is strategically positioned to absorb up to 80% of jobs, improve of capital income, increase value addition to raw material supply, improve import earnings, enhance capacity utilization in key industry, and unlock economic expansion and GDP growth. So that is a summary of the expectations of the SME sector in Nigeria today. Okay? If we are able to harness our SME sector appropriately, 80% of the jobs uh, uh, they, 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 are, they have the capacity of absorbing up to 80% of the jobs. So there is therefore a need to promote the SME sectors so that the problem that we're having today with unemployment will be greatly ameliorated if we're able to get more and more of our younger uh, people to go into the SME sector. Uh, if you are taking this loan, for example, today, if you are able to assess uh, 5, million, 5 million naira for any of the jobs that any of the businesses you have in mind, the expectation is that you should be able to employ one person. That is taking one person out of the unemployment market. If you are taking, if you are giving up to 10 million, the expectation is that you should be able to employ two people, okay? So that is how we are able to uh, reduce the, the unemployment situation. If over a hundred of you are able to take 10 million, uh, it means that we'll definitely have close to over a thousand uh, jobs created in the process because because of the multiply effect of the uh, of uh, the employment uh, situation, there's no way you have that kind of money that you will not need somebody to support you. And that is the whole essence of uh, of uh, the SME sector. Okay, uh, it is this potential. That's the potential of the SMEs that the that the government wants to explore and expand. But you re realize that there there exists a missing middle which is the SME, which is that SME still find it hard to assess funds. Okay, so this is where uh, the whole essence of this EGMIS loan uh, comes into play. The federal government realizes that the SME are a major source of employment 
major source of uh, contribution to our GDP. But they realize that the SMEs have a major problem. And one of that problem, one of that major problem is access to funds. That is the missing middle, okay? In all of the things that people want to do, all of you who are on this program today, uh, you, you are looking forward to, uh, to starting your own business. But how do you go about sourcing the funds for, for the business? Okay, so that is the question that uh, the federal government wants to answer. That's the question that the Committee of Bankers and CBN wants to answer. They realize that there is a missing middle. And what is that missing middle? The assets to funds. So the EDMIS loan scheme has come in as an avenue to provide the funds, easy funds, easily accessible funds for the SMEs to be able to assess and then uh, assess the funds to uh, start their own business. The EDMIS loan scheme is therefore government's response and solution to the missing middle, providing affordable and easily accessible funds uh, to this vibrant and explosive sector with a very high potential uh, to be a major backbone for Nigeria's economic development and growth. So that's the summary of it all, okay? The federal government realized the importance of the SMEs uh, in terms of providing employment, in terms of diversification, in terms of uh, GDP growth, in terms of per capita income for uh, the population of the country. But then there is the problem of uh, access to funds. So the EGMIS loan scheme is uh, expected to fill that gap, to fill that missing middle by being a source of easily accessible loan for uh, the missing, uh, the missing uh, middle. Right, so let's, uh, let's go to the next session. But before we do that, uh, we'll take a little break and then we'll open the platform so that I uh, will ask questions. If you have any questions to ask uh, in this introductory sector, uh, let's have your comments and then uh, before we proceed. Okay, so we'll, take, we'll open the platform. We'll open the platform now and then invite you to unmute your mics and then talk to us, okay? All right, so the, the class is open now. If you have any questions to ask, unmute your mic and then ask your question. You can unmute your mic and ask any question if you have any question. Please, yeah. I don't know if you have a question. I don't know if you have a question. Obioma, praise, uh, praise God. You have a question? Yes. Yeah, all right, let me hear you. No, no question? Okay. Yeah, Alaji. Alaji, Mohamed Alaji, you have a question? Sorry? Mohamed, Mohamed Alaji. You have a question? Okay, uh, Mohamed uh, Adimbu. They have a question. <laughs> Mohamed, you have a question? I didn't go. More distraction. Okay. If you have a question, you can raise your hand. If you have a question, raise your hand. If you have a question, raise your hand. If you have a question, raise your hand. And unmute your mic. If you have a question, raise your hand and ask your question. Okay, so no question, then we'll proceed. We we'll proceed. Okay, so we we'll proceed. All right. So 
we'll proceed. Uh, and the question on the on, on the board now is, uh, what is entrepreneurship? What is entrepreneurship? You all want to start a business? What's your understanding of entrepreneurship? What does entrepreneurship entail? Right, so let's answer the question. Defining uh, entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is the process of starting and running a, uh, a business enterprise, okay? Anything that you do that involves starting and running a business is entrepreneurship. It involves inv investing capital in, resource, capital in, res uh, in resources like people, in development of products and services to create viable commercial enterprises. It is the capacity and willingness to develop, organize, and manage a business venture along with any of its risks in order to make a profit. All right. So that, in, in short, is uh, what encapsulates uh, entrepreneurship. The singular act of investing capital in resources like people. People are resources. People are resources, services, products. If you have the willingness, the passion to invest in people, okay, in the products that you are interested in, and then the services to you want to provide, that is an entrepreneurial activity, okay? Yeah, a capacity and willingness to develop, to organize and manage a business venture along with the risk in order to make a profit. Basically, every business that we want to do, any business that we enter in the world, uh, is, has a profit, uh, a profit motive, okay? You want to make a profit. That's why you want to go into that business. But you cannot make that profit without venturing, without attempting, okay? And then, of course, whatever it is that you want to do involves some kind of risk. You have to take risk to be able to succeed, to be able to make that profit, okay? So your ability and then your willingness to develop, to organize and manage a business are with the mind to make that profit with the, all the risk that comes with it. That is entrepreneurship, okay? So uh, entrepreneurship is the process of starting and running a business uh, with the profit motive and then the willingness to take uh, a risk. That is what entrepreneurship is all about. Okay. The most obvious example of entrepreneurship is starting of a new business. So any business that you start, any kind of business that you start, okay, is entrepreneurship. Okay. The ideas that you have in your mind that you want to follow with a passion, uh, okay, to build it up, to become a, a standing enterprise with all of the risks, with the hope of profit, that is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurial spirit is characterized by innovation and risk taking. And it is an essential part of a nation's ability to succeed in an ever changing and increasing competitive global marketplace. So there is what we call the entrepreneurial spirit. And what is that entrepreneurial spirit? It's innovation, it's risk taking. And that is what the world over people encourage their, their citizens to go through. Uh, almost all over the world, uh, it's mostly in Nigeria that you see people uh, wake up and look forward to employment by government or go out on the streets looking for government. All over the world, what governments try to do is providing the enabling environment, okay, provide the enabling environment, the needed infrastructure, infrastructure like power, energy, infrastructure like roads, okay, infrastructure like, uh, uh, like all of the facilities that you require uh, so that you, your innovation is enkindled, and then you are ready and willing to take the risk. Okay, so that is what uh, characterizes uh, an entrepreneurial spirit. Okay, the in, the risk, the the uh, the spirit of innovation, starting something new, taking risks of, of uh, going into some kind of venture, overcoming fear. Okay, you find that the Western world generally has overcome fear, but we haven't been able to overcome fear until we are able to overcome fear. As Africans, we will not be able to make that kind of. Uh, uh, accomplishment. We will not have that kind of entrepreneurial spirit. Today we see the Western world sending people to the moon, to space. Okay, that is risk taking. That is what gingers them to to take uh, to innovate, innovation, create, and then of course uh, at the end of it all you succeed. But if you don't innovate, if you don't create, you don't take risk, 
there's no way that you can achieve anything. So that is what encompasses the entrepreneurial spirit. We need to overcome fear. And fear is a major, major challenge that we have uh, in Africa and in Nigeria. So who is an entrepreneur? Who is an entrepreneur? You ask yourself that, who is an entrepreneur? You that you want to go into a business, are you an entrepreneur? Who do you classify as your entrepreneur? Is it only the Angotes, the Tony Melus, the entrepreneurs, or uh, the Bill Gates, or Mark Zuckerberg? An entrepreneur is a person who takes the risk of investing his money, his time, and passion uh, in development of a business or several business enterprises. So anybody who is willing to take the risk, who is ready to invest his money, his time, his passion, okay, in development of a business or several businesses is an entrepreneur. So you that you want to assess this loan today, yeah, you have some basic ideas. Oh, I want to go into pottery business. I want to go into shoe making. Oh, I want to go into block making. It's an idea that you have in your head. Oh, I want to go into ICT, okay, to develop, to uh, have these startup hubs, okay, to develop a fintech, to develop uh, all sorts of apps. That is, an, that you are already an entrepreneur if you are ready to invest of your money to go to do that. If you are ready to give of your time and your passion. What drives an entrepreneur more than anything else is a passion, okay? When people are possessed, are, are passionate about any idea, and then they choose to go into, pursue that idea, looking and sourcing for money all over the place, and then you are able to create the time for that. That is an entrepreneur. That's the definition of an entrepreneur. So all of you who are on this program today, who have taken the challenge of the federal government, the Committee of Bankers and CBN, uh, to collect the forms, to, to pay your money, okay? Because that's, you're investing money. What you are doing in this training, the 10,000 you are paying for this training, you're already investing money. The lecture that you are attending now, you are investing your time. Like I said, about 36 of you apply for, apply for, for this class. But currently we have uh, just about 16. Okay, which means uh, still about 20 people have not been able to make the time, despite the fact that they have contributed their money. So the singular fact that you are ready to contribute the time and your money, and then of course, there must be a passion behind all of that. Whatever makes you pay money, makes you create the time, of course there's a passion for what it is that you want to do. You are an entrepreneur already. That's what an entrepreneur is. So you can look at yourself and say, yes, I am an entrepreneur for taking that singular action, singular step, uh, to go into the business that you have in mind. So, who is an entrepreneur? Who is an entrepreneur? Entrepreneur is someone who jumps off a cliff and builds a, a, a plane on his way down. Okay, that could be an extreme definition of an entrepreneur, but that's what an entrepreneur is. You jump off a cliff, and by the time you're landing, already you've come up with an aeroplane. So what it simply means is that you are ready to jump off the dark, okay, with your ideas, with your passion. And by the time you are done, you will reach down, you arrive at your destination, you already have an idea on, on, on your head, you already have uh, something on the canvas, something on the drawing board that will definitely fly. So that is what an entrepreneur is, somebody who is ready to take that, uh, that jump, ready to take that risk, okay? A limp to the unknown, but at the end of it all, there is an accomplishment. That is an entrepreneur. You can see on the picture on, on, the, on, on the screen now, a picture of an entrepreneur that you can you can't describe in the words given in that inter, in that uh, definition of an entrepreneur as somebody who jumps off of, off a cliff okay i don't know how many of you are familiar with him but uh, he is uh, elon elon musk i don't know whether you've heard of uh, of test of uh, tesla before tesla cars tesla cars are electric cars elon musk is the brain behind uh, the, the tesla car okay uh, we are the, today, generally, we say in the next 10 to 15 years, our oil, our oil and gas, our oil generally, okay, petrol-driven cars will go out of out of the market because of electric cars. And people like Elon Musk are those who are behind behind the uh, that that innovation and that uh, engineering feat. He is the chief architect of uh, of uh, Tesla, the electric cars. He is also the brain behind. Uh, SpaceX. SpaceX is, is an aviation industry. They, are, they make and create rockets, rocket uh, engines, and then take and then uh, space, space uh, craft. Okay, recently his uh, spacecraft, the S, S, uh, S, uh, SpaceX, 
uh, went into the orbit, took some people to the International Space uh, Center uh, in the orbit, okay, took them there and came back successfully. That is an entrepreneur. And that's the first time a private individual will be doing such, uh, be carrying out such a feat. Okay? If not, previously, it's only governments, the American government through NASA, uh, the Russian government, the India, and the Chinese uh, governments, they are the ones who are supporting it. But an individual, this is the first time that an individual will uh, create his own, uh, uh, his own spacecraft and then take and land people uh, in the International Space uh, Center and then bring them back successfully. That's entrepreneurship, okay? Starting from small and becoming a major enterprise. So we're still defining who is an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is any individual who starts a new business venture, a company, he arranges the business and takes the risk in order to make profit and to create social change. So this is just for purposes of emphasis because we have already discussed uh, what an entrepreneur, what an entrepreneur is and then uh, what it entails uh, generally. So what does an entrepreneur do? So that's an important question that we need to uh, address. What does an entrepreneur do? Okay, as an entrepreneur, what will you do? What are your expectations? Okay, so let's look at what an entrepreneur does. An entrepreneur identifies a need that no existing businesses addresses and determines a solution for that need. Entrepreneurial activity includes developing and launching new businesses and marketing them, often with the end a goal of selling the, uh, the business to turn a profit. An entrepreneur who, uh, who regularly launches new businesses, sells them and starts new businesses is a serial entrepreneur. Additionally, although the term entrepreneur is often associated with startups and small businesses, any founder of a successful household business began as an entrepreneur. So basically it's telling us that an entrepreneur, you as an individual today, whatever business that you want to go into, uh, must, have a, must have noticed that there is an existing gap, there is an, a vacuum. There is, there is a need for some businesses to fill that vacuum, to fill that gap, okay? So an entrepreneur is somebody, anybody, who identifies that there's an existing business uh, requirement that to provide a solution to what is needed within a community and then decides to go into that uh, business to fill that vacuum, to fill that gap. That's what an entrepreneur does. Okay. I don't know what your various line of businesses, but in the course of this, we'll also we'll ask you the question and then why you want to go into it. But you find that if you want to go into poultry business, for example, today, you must have noticed that within your own environment, there is the need for meat. Okay, And then, of course, you find that today, there's so much talk about uh, red meat not being too good for people. And then, of course, fish and, and uh, chicken are being encouraged. And you find that there's, a, there's a scarcity and then there's positive of that within the environment where you find yourself, within your community, and you decide to go into it, okay? You have identified the need for, uh, for uh, beef and fish, which are not red meat. So you want to fill that gap. Or you are in an environment where there's problem of portable drinking water. You find people going to the stream to uh, source for their water for drinking or for cooking. Then, of course, you know that there is a need for uh, clean uh, portable water within that environment. And you decide to, bore, to sink a borehole and then begin to package uh, 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 sachet water or bottled water. You have identified an existing need. You have identified a gap. And then you decide to go into that line of business to provide a solution for the need of that community. That is what an entrepreneur does. I'm sure many of you have the uh, intention and the plans of going into bottling uh, water or sachet water because you must have noticed that kind of challenge within the environment where you are. And that's why you are going into it, okay? So that's what an entrepreneur does. He notices uh, an existing gap, a vacuum, and then finds a way of filling it. That's what uh, he now chooses to go into that, providing that services. That is an entrepreneurial activity, okay? So let's look at some successful entrepreneurs. Okay, uh, first we have uh, somebody like Steve Jobs. I'm sure you all heard about Steve Jobs before. He's a late tech leader uh, who started up I gave an example of uh, the Apple products, uh, the tablet, their laptops, uh, the smartphones like the iPhones, uh, the, the iPads, uh, the, the iWatch, uh, the iPods, and all of those eyes. Those are products of uh, Apple. Apple today uh, has a capital base of about over 2 trillion naira, which is more than the entire revenue of the, of the whole country. That's just one company, okay? And how did Apple start? 
the apple started, uh, started by Steve Jobs and his friend in a garage, in a family garage, okay? Young men, straight from the college, okay? Looking out for what to do. And then they saw the gap, they saw the need for uh, small computers, portable computers uh, in the country, in the country, in the US. And they decided to come up with that idea. Today, it's a major company uh, with a capital base of over two trillion, income revenue of over two trillion, which is more than what Nigeria uh, is able to provide. Nigeria has a total revenue of just about four hundred forty-eight billion dollars, compared to just one company uh, with over two two trillion dollars. Uh, okay, so you can see the difference between what an individual uh, with the vision, with the passion, started from a garage, and today is a major revenue earner than the entire country, than the entire country of Nigeria. Bill Gates, I'm sure you're all are familiar with uh, Microsoft. There is no computer that you have in the world today on your table, on your, on your office, in your home that does not have something to do with Microsoft. Each time you buy a computer, you have put some money into, uh, into Bill Gates' uh, pocket, okay? Bill Gates is the creator and founder of uh, Microsoft, okay? And he's today listed as one of uh, the wealthiest uh, individuals in the world. His own company also started like that of Steve Jobs in a garage, in his parents' garage. Today, uh, Bill Gates is the wealthiest person in the world, one of the richest people in the world, uh, who has since left uh, Microsoft and is pursuing some other interests in, in the health services, uh, contributing substantially to the production of vaccines and then the treatment of uh, uh, anti-malaria uh, anti -malaria vaccines and the rest of those things. Uh, we already talked about Elon Musk, uh, who founded the SpaceX, and then the Tesla cars, uh, which I mentioned earlier. All right. So, so that's a picture of Steve Jobs. He's late now. We lost Steve Jobs in 2011 uh, from pancreatic cancer. Uh, all his achievements, uh, we lost a very, very successful entrepreneur who has left us with a lot of legacy. And of course, uh, Bill Gates, who we just talked about, the founder and creator of uh, Microsoft, uh, who today uh, is giving out half of his uh, money uh, to charity. Okay. Then, of course, the popular uh, Facebook. Here is the young man, the founder of Facebook. Uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is just about 33 years old today, but he is a multi-billionaire. Zuckerberg founded and uh, is the founder and owner of uh, Facebook. Okay, he saw the need uh, for interpersonal communication among people, and then developed the social networking service from his Harvard University dormitory in 2004. Okay, so you can see, you can all see the the small beginnings of these major enterprises. Apple from a garage, Microsoft from a garage. Okay. Facebook today from a university dormitory. Okay, we're all familiar with what university dormitories are. We've all gone through university, so we know what university dormitories are. That is where Facebook started, okay, in 2004. But by 2009, five years after, uh, uh, Facebook had, had over 500 users. Today, it has over 2 billion users and has a revenue base of over $6 billion. Uh, okay. Somebody, Mark, uh, Mark Zuckerberg today uh, is one of the richest people in the world and is actually giving, uh, giving, uh, giving away most of his, uh, his please uh, off, your, off your mic, mute your mic please, uh, this, okay, disturbance from the background. So Mark Zuckerberg is virtually giving out his entire wealth, okay, giving out uh, over 90% of his wealth during his lifetime in support of uh, charities and, and philanthropic activities. So that is what her entrepreneurs said. And for starting from, like they say, younger comes to mighty oaks. Today, uh, Facebook is a mighty oak with over 6 billion in revenue and uh, so much more still coming for a young man who is just about 33 years old. So let's look at uh, some of our own successful businessmen in Nigeria. I'm sure you're all familiar with these pictures. Uh, we have uh, Tony Alumelu, Adenuga, Angote, Tedola, and then Mrs. Awoshika. All these are examples of our own entrepreneurs in this, uh, in this country, starting as it were from small uh, businesses. Uh, Alumelu as a small, starting from a very small bank that swallowed a major bank. Uh, Adenuga, of course, uh, of Globacom, uh, who is a world leader today in Nigeria's telecom industry. Angote is uh, uh, the richest person in Africa today, uh, with vast interest in cement, in sugar, in oil and gas. Uh, we're all aware of how he started. 
collecting a loan of over 400,000 uh, naira from his uncle. And today is uh, has a major, it's a major, as a major conglomerate, and then the richest person in, in Africa. Tony Elumela, as I said, started from banking, and we can see what he's also doing. He's giving back. Tony Elumelu is giving back, uh, which is Tony Elumelu Entrepreneurs, okay, year in year out. But for this COVID situation, uh, on a yearly basis, he brings together young men from the entirety of Africa, okay who have business ideas, and then provides them with seed money, ranging from five to $20,000, uh, $5,000 to $20,000, uh, for them to go into their own enterprises, own entrepreneurial ent uh, enterprises. And on a year-to-year -year basis, he brings them together, and then there is a follow-up uh, with them to see how they are utilizing the fund and what they are making of uh, the seed money given to them by Tony Elumelu. Okay, that is giving back. That is encouraging other entrepreneurs, and that is the way to go. Because we, as we said, uh, agri-related businesses, SMEs, are the backbone of any nation's uh, uh, the economic development. On our screen, also, we have the picture of a young man. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this guy on the screen today. How many of you are familiar with the picture of this guy on the screen today? I'm sure you might not have seen him or heard his name, but he is uh, Nandi Ezebo. Okay. But if you are not familiar with his name, but I'm sure you have heard of Techno and the Infinix uh, phone brands today in, the, in this country. If you are familiar with Techno, you are familiar with Infinix phones, uh, phones then of course you know uh, Nandi Ezebo. He is the CEO, founder and CEO of uh, Slot Nigeria Limited. They are the owners of Techno. Okay. Uh, Ezebo's story is typical of most Niger young, young Nigerians. You know, after finishing his NYSC in 1996, he went around searching for white collar job. But of course, like many, uh, he was disappointed because he couldn't find any job. So what did he end up doing? He joined a computer repair shop, okay, as an apprentice. You know, and after settling and learning the, all the, 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 the wrongs, he set up his own uh, shop. And then from there, he migrated from repairing computers to selling cell phones. Okay, from there, what did he do now? He today he is one of those who is a major uh, dealer in in uh, in, in uh, computers and then in cell phone. What happened was that uh, in the process of uh, selling cell phones, he found that most Nigerians, typical of Nigerians, come with two three phones in their hands. And then he thought about there is a way we can go about this. Okay, instead of people carrying so many phones around with them. We can devise, develop a phone that can carry up to two SIM, SIM cards. They approached Nokia, Nokia phones, and they said, no, we would rather produce more phones and sell than to produce one with SIM, two dual SIM cards. They approached a Chinese, a young Chinese guy who left uh, his work as, uh, from a, uh, a phone ma manufacturing company, and the idea floated with him. So that is how they went ahead to design and then produce their own phone which they call techno with dual sales. Okay. And most Nigerians today are patronizing that phone because one, it is very, very effective. Uh, it stops the whole idea of uh, carrying two phones around with them. And then from techno, they now migrated also to Infinix to be able to make the phones available to as many Nigerians as possible. You know, there is nothing like uh, when you have a large population and then you have the, uh, bring down the, uh, the level of products, the pro cost of products to be able to have uh, more and more people have access to it. So today you have phones like techno ranging between uh, 35,000 to 50,000 and then the Infinix coming down as low as between 15 to 20,000 Naira to be able to, uh, for as many people low income and as, as possible to be able to access these phones, uh, which are uh, smartphones. And today they are the fastest uh, selling phones uh, in the Nigerian market today. So that is the story of uh, Nandi Ezebo. So, the question is, what kind of entrepreneur are you going to be? Are you going to be like Tony Ezebo, uh, Elumelu, or who? So let's look at the types of entrepreneurs that we have. We have uh, Forbes identified four types of entrepreneurs. The first is the innovator. The second is the specialist. The third is the opportunist. And then, of course, the fourth, the builder. Uh, the innovator starts uh, a business uh, because of his passion for innovation. Okay, we've talked about, uh, uh, about you know, uh, passion driving innovation. Then the specialists, these are experts, you know, highly skilled experts, okay, who also go into that, bringing their expertise to the, their line of business. 
Then the opportunists, these are the ones who see a gap, a vacuum in the community or in the society, and then find a way of filling it. Okay, that's an opportunist. Then the builder, that's, these are the ones who see, who go into building larger empires and infrastructure, uh, which where they find such opportunity providing itself in, uh, in the community. So let's look at them in, in a little bit more details. Uh, Joe Abraham uh, was the one who actually identified these uh, uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneur, the types of entrepreneurs. What he identified was that for every entrepreneur, no two entrepreneurs are the same. The entrepreneurs are wired differently. So he identified what he called the entrepreneurial uh, DNA, okay? The entrepreneurial DNA. And he identified four of these uh, uh, entrepreneurial DNA. The builder, okay, who builds, uh, who believes in building empires and structures. Okay, those ones are driven by uh, major scalable, large scale businesses, okay? They are not just satisfied with personal income, but they want to leave massive structures as legacies behind them. Then the opportunists, these are the ones who see the existing gap and provide businesses, uh, business to service that gap. Uh, individuals wired with this uh, DNA are highly optimistic, uh, master promoters, they enjoy marketing and sales. Okay, we give the example here of somebody like Richard Bryson. I don't know how many of you have heard of Richard Bryson, but if you've heard of uh, Virgin Air, uh, Virgin Rail System, uh, Virgin Music, that's the handwork of Richard Bryson, a maverick uh, who, is, who goes into all manners of uh, entrepreneurial activities. He was in Nigeria within uh, Virgin Nigeria, if you all remember very well, before he packed up after some, some years. Okay, he's the opportunist. He sees, a, vac he sees a, a vacuum in any of community and then comes around to fill it. Then the specialist, okay, these are, these are uh, skilled and experts who go into various businesses with very analytical minds, people like Bill Gates, they fit into this mold. Then the innovator, uh, this starts a business because of his passion and innovation. People like Mark Zuckerberg fit into this uh, kind of group, okay? They don't go in so much because of the money. Somebody like Mark Zuckerberg today, for example, his total salary, a multi-billionaire, his total salary from, from uh, Facebook is just $1 in, in, in uh, per annum, one dollar per annum. I don't know what anybody would do one dollar per annum, but that is the salary he takes from, uh, from Facebook. That has a, a revenue of over six billion on an annual basis, okay? And like I said, he's giving away almost 90% of his uh, income, of his uh, wealth uh, to the public in philanthropic activities. So what drives him is the innovation, okay? He's doing new things. And his entire thing is how he can reach mankind by opening up the space, by innovating, by creating, by giving. Okay. So those are the kind of uh, uh, entrepreneurs that we have. Their DNA is wired differently. So no two entrepreneurs are the same. Some are innovator builders, others are specialists and opportunists. So the question that we normally ask is, so which one are you? Which one are you? That's a question you need to ask yourselves. Which one are you? Which in type of entrepreneur are you? What DNA, uh, what kind of DNA are you wired with? Okay, and what kind of people surround you for your, with your work? Okay, if you know the kind of DNA that you are wired with, it helps you, okay, with the kind of people that you surround yourself to work with, the kind of team that you build, the kind of business that you go into, the strategies that you use, okay? So you need to know yourself, okay? You cannot say because ABCD work for this person, it will also work for you. It might not, okay? It might not. So you need to know yourself, you need to identify yourself and then know the kind of business that you go to, the kind of strategy that you need to go to. Okay, so types of entrepreneurs, we're also looking at uh, types of entrepreneurs here. The monotrepreneur, this uh, one who does only one type of business, uh, then the multi-entrepreneur or serial entrepreneur, someone who does different types of businesses we give the example of uh, Richard Bryson. Okay. Types of businesses for consideration. In Nigeria, what kind of businesses, popular businesses we have that uh, you can consider going into? Uh, like I said, I'm sure many of you already have the idea of what kind of business that you want to go into. But I've had people after the training, for even just this morning, before I left the house, uh, one of our participants uh, from uh, about seven or about six called me to receive so many calls this morning and I was almost running late to the office. And the questions they were asking is, after going through 
this training program, uh, we're beginning to have uh, uh, second thoughts about what we'll go into. Can you help give us an idea again? Can we discuss in more details? I said, well, I'm running for, uh, for my class. I'm taking the first class today. I'll call you after the class, and then we can discuss again. Because I say, we had this in mind before the lecture. But after going through the, the training, we're beginning to think that maybe we should give another one an, another idea. So we'll look at the kind of businesses that we have in Nigeria today, the most common businesses that we have in Nigeria. And then, of course, you look at it, compare with uh, what you have in your environment to see what you think will be best for your environment, your community, and what you think you'll be most successful in. Okay? So let's look at the kind of businesses that we have uh, uh, in Nigeria today. So type of businesses for consideration. Fashion. We all know what uh, the Nigerian fashion uh, industry is like today. It's a multi-billion naira industry today. Uh, Nigerians are some of the most colorful people, most well-dressed set of people we have in the world today. And our fashion is going into a whole lot of places. Okay, so that's something that we can look into. If you want to see the Nigerian uh, fashion market, uh, wait for occasions, wait for weddings, wait for major festivities. Okay, and that's when you see Nigerian uh, fashion. Uh, if you are followers of uh, there is there is uh, a major event in Ogun State on a year-to-year -year basis uh, around the Ijebu area. On a year-to-year -year basis, you see there are colorful Ashobi, different different groups, age groups, and all of that. And then you look and say, yes, Nigeria indeed is a marvel. Okay, so the, the fashion industry in Nigeria is a wonderful one that people can consider what they can do and go into farming. I mean, again, we've talked about so much about uh, agri and agro-related businesses. Uh, Nigeria is promoting, the government is promoting uh, more and more people to go into farming, agri-related businesses uh, because of the vast uh, opportunities and then the employment opportunities, uh, our need for self, uh, food sufficiency, food security, uh, our need to cut down on the bills of uh, import, importation of food items, our need to be able to uh, feed our large and teeming population. So it's key and very, very important uh, that uh, farming should be uh, one of the top areas uh, for consideration in the country. Those of you who have passion for farming can go into it. Even if it's not farming, like I say, agri is a very, very vast field with a vast uh, value chain. Okay, so it's not just the crop farming. Uh, there is also the processing, there is the marketing. Okay, uh, and then of course the other business ends of those uh, of agri that you can also consider going into. Small scale manufacturing. Okay. Uh, we said that uh, the manufacturing uh, the SMEs uh, consider about 96% of uh, the manufacturing sector. Okay, all of those small small things that you see on our streets, or uh, people with their generators, creating things, crafting and, and, and fabricating all manners of things, all those are manufacturing. That's how people start from. You start from small to mighty uh, major businesses. Catering. Again. Uh, our food, Nigerian foods are, are some of the most uh, wonderful areas of, uh, of, of uh, business that you can think about. Okay, we have today all manners of uh, delicacies we have in the country from different, different groups. Anytime we have uh, some of those kind of exhibition of Nigerian foods, you see, you see the diversity of our foods from the south to the north to the east and all of the ways. Uh, foods are something else that we have in this country. And when you go to major occasions like weddings, like festivities, that is when you see the culinary uh, expertise of Nigerians and the kind of things that we have. Buying and selling. Of course, buying and selling is not uh, majorly as, as, uh, funded in this, uh, in this loan, okay, in terms of just buying clothes and then selling. But like we keep saying, if you buy uh, things like textile materials, and you come and add value into it by turning into it into dresses, fashion uh, dresses, then of course it will be supported. Mm -hmm. But if you just go and buy the materials to come and sell, buy and sell, it might not be supported under this low scheme. So if you have uh, if you have in mind to go into buying and selling, then it should be something that also includes, uh, involves adding value. So it's very, very important that uh, you have that at the back of your mind if you want to go into that area. Event management. Event management is a new area. It's a new area in the country today and it's vastly successful. Uh, but for the COVID situation that has uh, virtually stopped most of our outdoor activities, uh, people in events management are having a, a major kill across the entire country today. Okay, so all over the country, you come to Abuja today, you'll find my queues all over. You have gardens all over. 
all those are event management areas. You have people, uh, all manners of uh, uh, catering outfits and then events managers who are able to set up your uh, events uh, uh, situation for you with some, some of the most magnificent uh, uh, decorations that you can ever think about. Can match anyone anywhere in the world. So those are areas that you can consider. Uh, animal husbandry. Here we are looking at uh, areas of ranching and keeping animals and all of those things. The country is trying to encourage uh, ranching, okay, because of the crisis of herders and farmers. So where we are able to harness that, harness uh, this area of animal husbandry, I'm sure it will be a major, major uh, area that people can consider going into. Uh, school businesses, daycare, nursery, crutch, that of course is a popular one. Uh, hospitality, we talked of catering already, uh, restaurant services, uh, digital currency investment that might not be supported in this project, but of course it's an area that you can consider. Photography is also uh, part of uh, our events, uh, events and, uh, and uh, arts and, and arts and entertainment uh, industry, which is uh, blooming. Uh, publishing, dry cleaning, cosmetic, health services. Uh, these are all major areas that uh, can we can also go into. Then let's look at uh, the vocational area. These are, these, are the, these are the crafts. These are areas that Nigeria needs majorly. Uh, a, a city like Abuja, uh, FCT, for example, I keep telling people is a city and a, a, a territory that will be under construction for the next 50 to 100 years, which means so long as there are construction going on, you need people with expertise in, in, in this area, electrical, plumbing, carpentry, masonry. Okay? Today, if you go to most, most of our of uh, construction sites. I was in a friend's house yesterday and I saw the marvelous work they did. And I said, so where did you get the technicians from? And he said, they are mostly Togolese. Unbelievable. Nigerians are not, are not going into those areas because by the time you see the POP, the tiling and all of those works did in that place and then the electrical pieces, they are marvelous handwork, okay? Fit for anywhere. You think that uh, you are out of, uh, of Nigeria and Africa, but that's the handwork, handwork of technicians. So we need to, if you are interested in that area, that's an area, vocational skills, where we have a depth of in Nigeria today, okay? You can set up a vocational institution where you can train people with that kind of expertise, bring them in, okay, to learn. The market is there uh, for people who are able to acquire these skills uh, for the construction industry that will be booming uh, for years and years to come. And definitely, you will be able to make in your own, breaking your own income uh, from that line of business. So, now let's look at things to consider before going into business. I raised this issue earlier, and I say, while you are considering going into business, have you thought about the things that you need to do? Have you considered the things you need to do before going into business? Or are you just looking at what? your colleague, your friend, uh, simply did and is successful. Uh, did you see your friend uh, running a poultry business and say, ah, no, uh, no, I'll also go into poultry or started a fashion house and you say, oh, okay, I'll also go into fashion, the fashion industry. Okay, these are things that you need to really, there are things that you need to look at, there are things you need to really consider. One of the things that you have to consider is, and the question you need to ask is, is there a demand for that line of business? Any business you want to go into, that is a key and number one question that you need to ask. Is there a demand for that line of business? Do people want that line of business? Okay. Will, is there a market for the poultry? Is there a market for the fashion industry? Okay. You need to ask those questions. Is there a market for the footwear uh, uh, business, the shoes and belts making business? Is there a market for it? So these are things you need to know. No, many businesses fail, caution now, many businesses fail because the entrepreneur set up a business that sold products and services people don't need. Okay? You could think that maybe it's because Mr. A is doing something in one community, that you can also come to your own community or society and do it, and then you'll be successful. No, you need to know whether people, okay, whether people need those services, need those products. Okay? Other set of business that produce or sold items that people could not afford. Okay, by the time you finish producing, can it be affordable? Will people be able to buy those items? Will they be able to uh, have access to it in terms of uh, the, uh, the cost associated with that? 
So all of those things that you need to know. You need to know the purchasing power of people within your community, within your environment, before you go into uh, that line of business, okay? So you need to ask the question, are there other biz people doing similar businesses? Or are you bringing something new to the table? Okay, uh, because you see somebody doing something and it's successful, you want to go into that line of business. Are you sure if you go in, you'll be able to compete favorably? Or is there something new that you are bringing to that same line of business that will pull people away, uh, pull people away from uh, your own business and then to be able to do something, uh, to be able to patronize your own product? That, those are the questions that you need to ask. If you are starting a business in an area where the market is already saturated, where there's already competition, the business might fail as you may find that you are struggling to keep up with the business. So that's, that's, the, that's the issue that you have to really have at the back of your mind. Okay, somebody else is doing it is in the line of business. It's maybe into bakery and making a lot of making bread and making a lot of money uh, from bakery and confectionaries. And you think you want to go into that line of business? If you go into that same line of uh, bakery business, you might run into challenge because you might not be able to break into that competition because he might have succeeded in cornering the market because of the kind of uh, product, the bakery products that he has. Okay, so if you are not going to go into that line of business with something new. Okay, new innovations, new kind of tests, or new line of uh, products in the bakery, then uh, you might run into problems. So you really have to uh, give serious consideration before you uh, go into that line of business. Uh, it's also Im important that you do some research to find out areas where the competition is not properly serving the customer and then position your business to fill the gap, okay? So whatever things that you want to do, you need to do uh, research. That's what we call feasibility studies. Tomorrow we'll be looking at feasibility studies. We'll be talking more about that, but you need to do some feasibility studies to find out if uh, uh, there is no competition in that environment, and even if there is competition, that you can also come in and compete favorably. Or whether where that business is not existing, you can come in to fill in the gap uh, within that environment. So it's important we have all that at the back of our mind before we go into any line of business. So an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur, you will have to work hard to differentiate your product and bring something different to the market uh, that no one else has ever seen. That is your unique selling point. We call it your USP, unique selling point or unique selling proposition. So what we're saying in essence is that if already there is a, a, an existing line of business, and you want to go into that same line of business, okay? Just give the example of a bakery now. You want to still go into that same line of, of, of bakery, and you said, well, there is competition, but I know what I'm bringing into the market in terms of the kind of products I'm going to bring, okay? That is your own unique selling point. That is what is going to differentiate you from uh, what exists currently. So you decide to see, despite the competition in bakery, in, business, in bread making, and then you still go into that same line of business because you are sure you are going with a unique uh, selling point, something that differentiates you from the existing uh, uh, bread, uh, bread in the market, and then you go in to compete, okay? So find out something that makes your own business stand out. Uh, in the, it's very, very critical to the survival of your enterprise. So those are the things that you need to consider, okay? And if you still decide to go headlong into that line of business, be sure that whatever it is you are going for, there is something unique about your own product, okay? So it's key and important that uh, we look at that line of uh, business. So again, let's look at things to consider before going into business. Determine what, what needs are out there. What are the things that are out there that are needed, okay? What are the things that are out there that are needed? You need to find out what the needs are in your community, in your environment. What business exists to, so, to satisfy these needs? Okay, are there already other businesses within that environment, within that community to satisfy those needs? And you still want to go into it or you want to go into those that are not there? If there's no business currently satisfying those needs, it could mean that no one has thought about it. Okay? So if you have an idea, you find that there's no business along that line, okay, within that environment, which means maybe nobody has thought about it, and then you can think about going into it. But then there is the other uh, alternative also, that there is no market, uh, not enough market to make you set up that business. So you could see an environment, but people may, maybe might not have the purchasing power, okay? So the market might not be there. 
So you could go into a, a line of business and then you find that uh, uh, you, that the, the market really doesn't exist, okay? Because people don't have the powers to, to make those procurement. So if you go into it, will the business be viable? So these are things you need to consider. Then the cost of carrying out the business in that environment could be too expensive. So you have to be sure that the infrastructure is there, the infrastructure needed is there, okay? The market is there, uh, the, uh, the power supply is there, and the water needs are there. So it's key and important because if the, the, uh, the power infrastructure, for example, is not there, it means you might have to uh, provide your own power source generator. You have the money to buy a diesel to power a major enterprise within that environment. And if you are able to do that, you are spending over 2000 plus on a day-to-day -day basis to, to power a generator. Will you be able at the end of it, uh, the, the, uh, your products, will you be able to sell and still break even with that kind of uh, capital outlay? These are things that you need to consider. These are things that you need to have at the back of your mind uh, when you want to uh, go into business, okay? so. Again, you have to ask, you have to determine what needs are out there. You uh, ask the question. When you ask those questions, you will be surprised what you might find. So you need to ask the question because the kind of responses uh, you get will surprise you, will help you uh, to go along with that uh, business or not, okay? So you might need to administer questionnaires. Develop a small questionnaire. And then administer it around, then ask questions. Okay, so that you are able to get some feedback and then know uh, the kind of expectations and what uh, uh, people uh, are demanding for or what people need within that kind of community. Uh, today we have the social media, which is a major source of feedback for uh, any for any prospective uh, uh, customers. So you want to go into any business, uh, go into Facebook, other social media outlets, ask the question, just Post your, post your products online. You see the kind of response that you get. If it's positive and you think the market is there, you pursue it. If the response is not uh, so welcoming, so receptive, then you, you let it be, okay? Read journals, online sites that give you information about the market, then look around, okay? Look around and observe yourself, okay? These are some of the ways that people like Bill Gates and then Steve Jobs uh, went about their business. How, that's how they started. They observed, they noticed what is uh, within the environment. Somebody like us, uh, Bill Gates made the proposition that, look, uh, in the next decade, they want to supply, they want to supply uh, computers, okay? Microcomputers on every, on the desks in every office across America and in every home in America. And that was, that was what he observed. He found the, the need for communication. He found the need for automation of, uh, of businesses in offices and then decided to go into it. Okay? And today, what we have under a decade, what he saw, what he foresaw had been fulfilled. Today in every office, today in every home, there is a computer. Okay? Any office you go in Nigeria today, you'll find nothing less than two, three laptops. You go to every home today, every every child, the parents all have laptops today or tablets. And that is uh, in fulfillment of the dream of uh, Bill Gates and, and Steve Jobs. Okay, so that's what observation does for you. And then you, so you need to be very, very observant about what's obtainable in your environment, in your community, and then you see what you can, how you can go about it. So, we well, looked at uh, what you need to consider before going to business. Then the next important thing is, what are the barriers to starting a business? Okay, as we said in the introductory remark, anything in life that I want to do, you definitely run into some kind of hurdles. You know, there's no smooth sailing anywhere. The world is not about uh, bed or roses. Okay, even that this, as they say, roses uh, have tongues. So even while you're appreciating your roses, before it's caught and, and, and primed and then trimmed and put into uh, searches and brought to the market, there are tongues. Okay, the farmer has to battle with the tongues on the roses, okay, before it's brought to you. And then you uh, begin to appreciate uh, the aroma and the beauty of the rose. So there are barriers. You want to start a business, there are barriers that you have to overcome. So what are these uh, main barriers, main hurdles that we uh, run across in, uh, in starting a business? Uh, in your own, okay, uh, I'm just trying to highlight uh, what uh, these issues are, but everybody has its own peculiar kind of uh, 
barrier or hurdles that he faces. So we'll just look at the main ones and then you will look at your own, which is peculiar to you. And then let's see, uh, we can compare those and see uh, how we can build and then uh, help each other uh, overcome those barriers. So one of the main barriers, of course, is money. Okay, money. This is one of the most vital resources an entrepreneur needs to start a business and probably the most critical barrier to starting a small business. How much do you need to start? And where are you going to get the money from? Okay, you are all here on this program today because you want to start a business. You have a business idea, but money is a problem. Okay, so you have to decide how much do you need to start a business? And then where are you going to get it from? Okay, okay. so the Agnes loan scheme is an avenue where you can get that, that money from. And then of course, how much you need will depend at the end of this program, uh, by the time you look at uh, the kind of business you want to go into, and then the, the uh, amount available for the loan scheme, then you'll be able to decide how much you need to start. The whole thing is about starting, really, the kind of money you require to start with. Then lack of knowledge. Many small businesses fail, not for lack of capital, but because the entrepreneurs had little knowledge of the business. You know? They don't know when is the peak and low season for their business. Yeah, so you might have the capital, you might have the money, but you have the knowledge about that line of business. You know enough about that business. That business you want to go into, do you know enough about that business? Okay, that's something that you need to, if you don't know enough, you need to read more about that line of business, okay? You need to know what's obtainable within that environment. Okay, you want to do a business in Nigeria. Do you know the kind of government policies that we have, the kind of taxes? Today, Nigerian businesses in Ghana are having challenges, okay? Because many of them went into Ghana because there's a market there. Then the Ghanaians are not uh, that uh, business savvy. But by the time they arrive, uh, set up their businesses, suddenly the government of Ghana is uh, slamming them with, uh, with uh, uh, a tax bill of about $1 million. $1 million. Where are you going to get $1 million from? If you change it to Ghanaian currency or Nigerian currency, that's we're looking about uh, 100 and something uh, uh, million uh, naira. To, to run your business, how much are you going to make to be able to sustain in that, to stay in that kind of market? Are you going to make up to $1 million in, in Ghana, in the Ghanaian market? Okay. In the Nigerian market here today, uh, today in today's papers, we are seeing where uh, poultry farmers are, are grieving that uh, government policy banning importation of maize is going to take its toll on, its, uh, on the poultry business because of the feeds. You know? So you might be in business, you are running your business, all of those things are available. Then suddenly, bam, government comes up with a policy that you know, we are banning importation of, uh, of maize. And maize is an important uh, component for feed meals, for your chicken, for your fish, and all of those things. So it's important that you are familiar with the policies, government policies, the taxes within the environment. Okay, we are used to five percent of VAT. Suddenly, it's now seven point five percent. We are used to stand duty of uh, five percent. Today, it's uh, seven percent. And then, government is driving all of those things aggressively, and people are groaning. So you have to be very, very familiar. You have to have that knowledge. Okay, will the business be able to generate cash immediately, or will it have to sell on credit? If you start a business. Are you likely to be able to generate cash or are you going to sell on, business, on credit? If you sell on credit, will you be able to recover your money from those who buy on credit? It's always a major challenge. People who buy and sell, they know what it is. They'll give out their products and they expect payment, but then some of them never get anything back. Are the products perishable? Okay. Uh, how long does it produce those goods? Uh, does it take to produce the goods? And will it be affordable to uh, your customers will they be able to afford it okay uh, after production so all of those things are things that you need to consider another major barrier is determination you will have to develop the courage of a bulldog and maintain the determination uh, that will enable you to smash through obstacles as there will be many along the way okay there will be many along the way you need that determination you need determination to keep focus pick up when you fail and face rejection and to continue to look for new solutions and strategies. Okay. Most people, the very first moment they run into any obstacle, okay, they give up. Okay. The very first obstacle they run into, the very first major barrier they run into, they simply give up. But we are saying here that you need determination, okay? because there's nothing that you do that you not face one challenge or the other. Even if you fall, stand, pick yourself up, stand and continue forging ahead. You find that if you are able to continue, 
is very persistent, you'll be able to come across, go across all of those barriers that you, you face. But if at the first hurdle, uh, you give up, put your hands on your head and say, no, I give up, then of course, there's no way you'll be able to succeed. So it's very, very important that uh, you keep pushing and charging on. Fear, our greatest enemy. Fear is one of the greatest barriers to people starting a business. The question they ask is, what if I fail? What if I make a fool of myself? What if I'm rejected? And people say no. You know, I, I said when we were, uh, started earlier, I said one of the greatest uh, uh, challenge that we have in Africa, in Nigeria, is that we have not overcome fear. The Western world has overcome fear. But we are scared. We are fearful. We are a very, very frightened, uh, fearful set of people. We are scared of the dark. We are scared of the unknown. We are not ready to take challenges. Today, with the Western world, like I said, has taken people to the moon and brought them back. Today, they are in orbit. People are in orbit. They are in the space, the space center in orbit. And they are there for months on end. And you see coming, some coming back and going back, coming and going, coming and going. I just gave the example of uh, Elon Musk, a private individual who created, who, who uh, built his own uh, uh, rocket uh, uh, engine and sent people to the, to, to the space station taking some, uh, some, some, uh, some products back to them. And then of course, after some months, the people came back and brought them back successfully. How many Africans, how many Nigerians would dare even to, 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 to travel on our roads today, we're scared. We're not ready to take any, to, to take any uh, initiative because of fear. If we're not able to overcome fear, there's nothing that we can, we can do, accomplish. What if I fail, so what? Are you the first, are you going to be the first to fail? What if I make a fool of myself? So what? What does that mean? Are you going to be rejected? So what if you are rejected? People like Bill Gates, there's this, the, this popular story about Bill Gates and uh, IBM. I'm sure you're all familiar with IBM. IBM is an international business machine. Then it was the most popular uh, computer, computer uh, company in the world with large uh, mainframes. Mainframes were computers that occupied major floors, major rooms. Va mass, massive machines, okay? Those were the first set of computers the world knew, okay? Bill Gates approached them with the idea of the microcomputers, small computers, table computers. And they said, no, there was no way it was going to be successful. Today, they are living in regrets. One of their major regrets today is because of uh, Bill Gates, okay? The same thing will have the story of, uh, of uh, Yahoo Mail and, uh, and uh, American Online. They were approached by, by people like, uh, like, like uh, Mark Zuckerberg and the rest of them, they rejected them, saying that there was no way these businesses will succeed. And of course, Bill Gates. But today, these are the major industries that we have. IBM today is as moribund as anything you can think about, okay? Nobody, nobody is buying any uh, mainframe computers today. All we have today are even computers that you can put in your pocket. The iPhones that we carry around today are computers for all they are, okay? Thomas Edison, who created the electric bulb, tried and failed severally before they discovered the filament uh, made of copper, which today provides the electricity that we know. Honda in Japan, when he came up with the idea of Honda cars, uh, he was laughed at. Today, Honda is a, is a major name. They built the, the Wright brothers who started the aeroplane today. When they started with the idea of flying, they told them there was no way a major metallic object can fly in the sky. Today we have jumbo jets flying all over the world today. So they have many people have tried before us and failed and then rejected. They kept trying and, and until they have perfected what they are doing today. And today they are major uh, industries and their name is etched in, in uh, gold and legacies left behind for the world today. So what are you going to do to also be able to leave a legacy behind? Are you going to give up on the very, very first uh, try if you are rejected or if somebody thinks you are making a fool of yourself, no, don't just don't listen to them. Look at people like Bill Gates, look at people like the Wright brothers, look at people like Thomas Anderson. There should be the people you should emulate, not those who laugh at you and uh, call you names and think you are making a fool of yourself. Another major barrier is lack of support. Okay? Many small businesses lack support in the critical areas of funding. Uh, we talked about that already. And then the legal and regulatory support, okay, in terms of uh, government regulations and things like that. Um, one of the topics that will be taken is uh, business registration and regulatory compliance. So we'll be discussing more about uh, that subject 
uh, in the next few days. Staying power. Staying power is like uh, is like determination. Okay. Most startups uh, don't have the staying power. The moment they face a little challenge, they simply give up. So uh, we need to have the staying power, the determination. So they go hand in hand. All right. So we're coming to the tail end of uh, of this uh, topic now. We'll be looking at sources of funding for small businesses. So what are the sources of funding for small businesses? The first one is equity. Uh, we have loans, we have grants, we have cooperative loans, and we have crowdfunding. So let, let's look at them, uh, these uh, subtopics uh, quickly uh, so that we run off the, the topic. Equity. Equity is an investment made in, in the shares of a business. It is made with uh, an understanding that the investor will get a return on their investment and appreciation on the capital when they are invested. Uh, equity is a good source of funding for entrepreneurs as it is more long term in nature and gives the entrepreneur enough time for the business to take root. So what we're saying here essentially is that uh, uh, equity uh, is like when you, when you buy shares in a business, okay, you contribute your money by buying shares in a business, okay, with the hope that by the time it becomes profitable, you'll be able to get some returns on your investment. So that basically is what equity is all about. And the good thing about equity is that uh, it is long term. If you, are, if you are ready to make that kind of, uh, provide that kind of funding to an entrepreneur, you know that it's going to be long time. You have to give the business time to take root, to mature before you expect anything to come, come back. So it's not something that you are putting money and then the next day you expect some kind of returns. It takes a little time for uh, the money to mature and come back. So uh, when, uh, uh, as an entrepreneur, you approach a person and say, come and then uh, buy some shares in my business, then you know, of course, the person is uh, coming for long-term investment. So what are the sources of equity? Uh, they come from savings, they come from partners, they come from uh, investors and, uh, and family. Of course, savings, we know uh, what savings are all about. Uh, ability to set aside some little money from your salary or from the work that you do. Uh, savings are not the easiest things to do. Uh, but it requires a lot of effort, it requires a lot of uh, discipline and sacrifice to be able to put some money away. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, you should learn the habit of uh, doing some small savings. Uh, if you want to uh, be able to put some funds away for business. Partners, of course, uh, these are, could be friends you bring together uh, to join you in your business to contribute uh, their own little contributions towards the business. Investors are people who uh, put their funds into something in order to get a return, like the uh, equity which we talked about. Angel investors, these are wealthy private individuals who invest in business in exchange for some equity in the business. Uh, angel investors are, are mostly very wealthy people, like you said. Uh, they come into a uh, business of, uh, of an entrepreneur because they want to mentor them, they want to support them, they want to help them grow. Okay, So in putting their money in, they are not looking for immediate returns, but they want to see how they can help you grow, how they can nurture you, how they can also prop you up uh, to come there along the lines that they have uh, already achieved uh, to make a success of uh, their own business. They are not likely to trouble you, uh, ask for their monies immediately. If anything, they are more like mentors. That's why they are angels. Partners, we talked about them, family and friends. Uh, as I keep telling most of the classes that we have, most of, most of us who go into business, the first set of people that invest in our businesses as uh, young startups are our family, okay? Our parents, our fathers and mothers are the first set of people that we approach. We have an idea, we approach them and say, Daddy, I have this idea and I want to go into this line of business. You find that your kids, your children will always uh, approach you for, uh, for some source of funding each time they have a business idea. I've had that experience with my kids and they have always come over asking for one support or the other uh, for their own business. So I'm sure many of you who are uh, uh, nursing the idea of going into their businesses, most have also approached their parents and then friends uh, to provide the kind of seed money. So uh, family and friends are a major source of, uh, of uh, uh, funding for small businesses. Loans, yeah, that's why we are here. We are all in this uh, program today because we are looking for, for the Agnes loan. A business loan is money given to an entrepreneur to finance the purchase of an asset or fund the business's uh, recurrent expenditure. Okay? Loans can either be interest-bearing or non-interest-bearing. 
uh, in the formal, the borrower and the lender agree on the rate. The loan is tenure for a specific period, and at the end of the tenure of maturity, the borrower must repay the loan uh, to the uh, lender together with the interest accrued. So loans are, are, are monies that we give to an entrepreneur okay, to help them purchase an asset or to fund their businesses. And then, of course, all of us who are on this program today are on the program because we want to assess uh, the EGNIS loan, okay, which uh, uh, NASA Microfinance is providing to uh, small businesses, those who want to start their own businesses, to invest in, the, in, in their business. Okay? Loans, again, they are interest-bearing. Okay? Like the ones that we are going for, uh, these are interest-bearing loans. Okay? said that it's 5% interest, it's tenure, seven years tenure, and uh, there is a maturity period. After seven years, it matures, which means you have to repay after seven years. Then there are the non-interest uh, uh, bearing loans, which is given by banks like the JS, like uh, Taj Bank, okay? These are based on Islamic banking principles that do not uh, uh, pay interest, that do not uh, come with uh, interest. So you are giving a loan, uh, there is no interest uh, payment assigned to it. If anything, it's more like a profit sharing, uh, sharing of uh, the process. And then of course, there's hardly any possibility of a default because if you fail, there are ways they are able to recover their, their money. Okay, by uh, repositioning the property, selling and then sharing whatever comes out of it. So those, those are the ideas behind loans, interest-bearing and non-interest-bearing loans. Okay? So how do we assess loans? Where do we get loans from? From banks, which is uh, what uh, the, uh, the NASA Microfinance Bank, which we're applying to today, uh, is, uh, is a source of uh, part of the loans that we're looking for. Okay. Then partners who also provide loans, uh, which we discussed about earlier. Then grants. Grants is another source of uh, loan uh, of uh, uh, funding for small businesses. Grants are funds given to small businesses by donor organizations. Usually, the donor does not uh, retain an interest in the business. However, to ensure that the money is actually uh, being used for the purpose intended, the donor will set up processes to ensure the pro project is properly uh, implemented. Uh, we have so many donor organizations in Nigeria today. Many of them come with uh, international organizations, uh, agencies like the uh, DFID. Uh, these ones are major. You said uh, the DFID is uh, a UK-based uh, Department of Finance and, uh, and, and Development, uh, which which uh, provides uh, grants to small businesses who are into a whole lot of businesses within the environment to assist uh, the communities. Uh, USAID also, you said also assists and um, provides such uh, grants to organizations that identify who are into uh, small businesses, social enterprises, uh, put the, uh, the support, uh, seeing that they also contribute to the community. Grants can be given by government organizations, development partners, family trusts, not-for-profit organizations and wealthy individuals. Those are the sources of grants, government organizations, development uh, partners, and the like. Okay, uh, in Nigeria, these are some of the sources of uh, grants. Smedan, Smedan is a small medium enterprises the, uh, development uh, agency of Nigeria, DFID, which I talked about. Shell LifeWire funds. Shell LifeWire fund is popular in the Niger Delta area. Uh, this one was established by the Shell uh, Development uh, Company, uh, the major oil producing company uh, in the Delta area, Niger Delta area. They provide this life wire funds to support, support small, small businesses, okay? Support small businesses, uh, young men who want to go into businesses because of uh, employment uh, challenges within that environment, to take them out of trouble, take them out of militancy, and then of course, provide the necessary funds and then the materials they require to run up these businesses. So they are a major source of uh, uh, sources of funds for in the country today. We have a TISALA, uh, Easy Business Million Grant, we have the TY Anjuma, uh, Bank of Industry, MTN. They, are all, they all provide grants uh, in Nigeria today. Cooperative loans. Yeah, in most uh, organizations, most offices, or those of us who are working, we have cooperative societies, okay, that provide cooperative loans. Uh, cooperative societies are independent groups uh, of people who come together uh, to offer mutual support and cooperation to each other. Okay? Individuals within the cooperative contribute money on a monthly basis or quarterly basis, and these funds are either used to fund activities of uh, the cooperative or giving out as loans 
to individuals, individual businesses of interested members. So you find that in most organizations that we go today, we have these cooperative societies where we can approach to take loans to uh, start our own businesses, some to rent houses, some to buy cars and all of those things. So that has, the cooperative loans are very, very popular in Nigeria today. And we know from cooperative societies have actually grown up to be major banks in Nigeria today. You know, we used to have in those days uh, the cooperative uh, bank of Western Nigeria, which uh, was a major, a major, uh, a major cooperative society that started as a small, uh, with a small number of people, but grew up to be a major bank in Nigeria uh, today. So that is a major source of uh, uh, loan for small businesses. Crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is becoming more and more uh, popular in the world today. These are internet-based uh, sources of uh, generating funds. You have an idea, you throw it on the internet, uh, asking people to go fund me, to come out and support your idea and initiating, because you highlight what good it's able to make. You highlight what you are able, you will be able to establish and accomplish with it, where other people can also benefit. And in that kind of crowdfunding, by the time you are able to start that line of business, those who contributed to it will either uh, benefit from it, or so long as it's benefiting the general public or the larger society, of course, uh, the, the day has been made. So that is where crowdfunding comes. Today we have uh, Crowd9, for example, uh, we have all these uh, uh, businesses like the Bitcoins and all these uh, uh, and, and all those kind of uh, businesses and uh, lottery systems that we have on the system today, they are all based on uh, crowdfunding. We have major uh, factories like the Alliance, Alliance uh, products, uh, the Forever products, all of those things uh, grew out of uh, crowdfunding initiative. So these are all manners of, uh, of uh, schemes which today uh, people drive uh, their funds from to start their own businesses. So. That is about uh, sources of funding for small businesses. So we have uh, come to the end of our of this uh, paper, and uh, we will now open up the floor so that we take questions and answers. And then, uh, if there are any things, any issues you want uh, to discuss, one any issues you want us to talk about, feel free. Uh, feel free. Uh, you can unmute your mic so that we can be able to discuss. Yes, Look like some people are in the office and uh, they're coming in major. All right. So we're opening the class now, and then uh, people can ask a uh, question. If so you have any question you want to ask, uh, in uh, this discussion that we have, please feel free to do that. All right. So the floor is open now. If you have any question, please uh, feel free to ask. Okay. Praise God. You have a question? <laughs> the floor is open. Hello. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, Is there a difference between uh, animal husbandry and poultry? And poultry? Yes. Yeah, animal sure husbandry that... and poultry. Yeah, sure. Poultry is about birds, about keeping birds, chicken. Okay. Dog, turkey, that's that's a uh, poultry. Animal husbandry, of course, is about uh, cows, about goats, about sheep. So that's animal husbandry. Okay, you could set up a ranch, okay. you could set up a ranch for things like that, and then a poultry farm for the birds. Okay, between the two, now which one did Agnes encourage more? Oh, they support all of them. It's uh, it's your choice. You have to make the choice. Oh. But I, I know poultry is very, very popular with most people because of uh, 
uh, the ease and then the period gestation period. Okay, within six months, you're able to start selling your, your, your brawlers. Uh, within three months, your six yeah. months, again, you are able to start having your layers and that's the eggs for sale. So in terms of fast returns, uh, uh, poultry might uh, do it. But of course, uh, the animals, uh, it takes a long time to breed a cow or a goat. So that one is a little bit much longer. Okay, as your capacity of uh, consultant, because yes. what I have in mind is the poultry, but it's like yeah, 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 more, more people are going into that. So I'm looking at the probability of getting it, as in because of the uh, population of people going into that. Well, it's not about the population, it's about the market, the market availability. Is there a market for for eggs, a lot of it. Is there a market for chicken? A lot of it is all year round, okay? So there's no period that you say, oh, no chicken or yeah. eggs will not, be, uh, will not be required or will not be needed, okay? All year round is there. Yeah. Uh, you, could, you could target it and, and breed so that you are able to sell within some, uh, within uh, festive periods. I know people who start breeding uh, chicken from around June targeting the Christmas period when there's a lot of market for poultry, uh, for chicken, okay? That's something you could consider. But eggs, of course, is something that on a day-to-day -day basis, people are eating bread, uh, egg on a daily basis. So there's always a market. And of course, animal husbandry is good, but like I say, it's the gestation period you are looking at. If you are able to, if you can wait as long as uh, it takes, and then, uh, of course, the challenges these days of uh, cattle rustling and those, all those kind of challenges is a major problem there, really. But all these are things you have to put into consideration. But above all, your own, uh, your own passion will have to drive it. Yeah. All right. All right. So is, is value chain encouraged? Value chain? Value chain business. Yes, like uh, I want to do the poultry and then aspect of the feeding and other things related to that. Is it encouraged here or I have to like pick only one thing and stick to it? Yeah, yeah the bank will support just one. Uh, it's a mono loan. So if you, want to, you, if you want to go into poultry, they'll only support the poultry now, okay, for you to pursue. Okay. But nothing says that when you become profitable, going down the line that you cannot diversify. But the loan they will give you now at this point oh. in time is for just poultry. If you want to go for animal husbandry, that's the one oh. they will support now. But nobody says that down the line in a year or two, when you've made your own money and you're paying back, you cannot diversify. Okay? But oh. the one they will support okay. now is Thank just you. one. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Welcome, man. Any other question? Any other question? Ian Achoya, you have a question. Irome. Yes, I'm here. I've got, I, don't have, I don't have any question for now. OK, thank you. Chioma, uh, Obioma, praise God. You have a question? Unmute your mic. Unmute your mic. Hello. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Are you hearing me? Hear you. That's your letter. You say four types of entrepreneurship. The first one I could not get is very well. Please, can you understand the first type of The first one, the first the types of entrepreneurship you mentioned. Hello. The types of entrepreneurship you mentioned. You mentioned four types of entrepreneurship. Hello. Hello, network. I can hear you. Are you hearing me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay, so you mentioned four types of entrepreneurship. Yeah. The first one you mentioned, I not get you well. Please. The what first is the first one? You explain? Yes. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Don't worry. We'll, take... we'll look at Hello? you. I can hear you. Don't worry. We'll look at you. 
Okay, the builder. Yes, the innovators. Which one? Am, the innovator. The first, yes, innovator. Yes, the innovator. Okay, the innovator. I gave you an example of, uh, of the innovator. Yeah, I gave you an example of the innovator and the example of uh, Mark Zuckerberg. The innovator is one yes. who is driven by innovation, producing new products, new things. Okay. His, his, passion, okay. his passion is about innovation. And I gave you the example of Mark Zuckerberg, okay. who has, I said, started the Facebook uh, and today is more into more and more production. He's not driven by the money. He has made so much money to the extent that he wants to give out almost 90% of his uh, wealth, okay? But okay, he keeps okay, producing new things on and on and on. That's what drives him. It's okay. not the money, but what he can okay. do to contribute to mankind. That's what the innovator does. Okay. All right. Okay, okay. I can get it now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Any other question? Any other question? All right, so we'll close the class uh, if we don't have any other question again, so that uh, we'll convene tomorrow. Uh, I want to thank you for spending your time with us, spending this morning with us. I know you are all busy people, so I allow you to go back to your job. And uh, we'll reconvene again tomorrow by 10. Uh, the next topic we'll be taking tomorrow is feasibility studies and business plan, uh, where our facilitator will put you through uh, with uh, emphasizing more about the things you need to do before you go into business. That's uh, the area of feasibility studies, okay? So let's reconvene again uh, tomorrow. Uh, but before we go, we are going to post again on the platform uh, the, uh, the quiz, the post-lecture quiz to see uh, the difference between uh, the responses you give uh, now after the lecture and then the one that uh, uh, you gave before the lecture, okay? So if you check on, your, on the WhatsApp platform now, uh, you see the quiz which we we'll, are we'll going to repost, okay? So you can try it again. And when you are done, please post your scores. Post your scores on the platform so that we can see how you did, okay? All right. So we'll see you tomorrow, and then we'll talk, we'll discuss more on, uh, on, on this, on your submission today. All right, so have a wonderful day ahead of you, but don't go back to the WhatsApp platform now and check where I posted the, uh, the quiz again for you to repeat. Let's see how it goes, okay? So when you are done, post the, the pre-lecture quiz and then the post-lecture uh, post quiz. Let's see the difference, okay? All right, thank you. Have a wonderful day ahead of you. See you tomorrow.